Okay, so here we are to talk about Zoom bombing and how to prevent it. Now, the first thing to know is there's a lot of different reasons to be using Zoom. You might be having a small meeting with just a couple of known people in it. You might be having a huge performance. You might be having a larger meeting with 20 or 30 people there. And each one is going to have its own requirements. Um, so I'll try and identify them as we go through. The important thing to know is that um, you, you get to set these for yourself. I'm going to give you the uh, best practices here as far as I can tell. But whatever you set up here, you can always change it on a meeting by meeting basis if you need to. So uh, don't, be, don't be thinking you're making a decision here that you can never undo. The other thing worth noting is um, what is Zoom bombing? Zoom bombing is when somebody comes into your meeting and they attempt to um, put something on your screen or in, in any number of different ways that uh, is offensive or disruptive. And so what we're going to do here is show you how to prevent that. These are not necessarily all the things you should be doing for Zoom in general, but in particular, those that have to do with keeping your meetings uh, safe, as safe as can be from being disrupted. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, find your way to your settings page, and depending on whether you're a Mac or a PC, you'll have several different ways of getting there, but let's assume you've gotten yourself to your settings page. Let's have a look at the first set of um, settings here. The first one is under host video, and that's one where you're going to say, uh, do you want to start your meeting with your video on? And I prefer to, so I leave that turned on. Um, but I'm going to leave participants' video shut off. And this is one of the first things you can do to fight Zoom bombing. Um, people can't just jump in with video blazing or some kind of image in their video there. Um, it's going to be shut off. If you don't recognize them, you can decide whether you want to turn it on or not. Um, the next one, audio type, just leave that to computer and um, telephone and computer audio, not, not a Zoom bombing thing. Join before host. This is something that I strongly recommend you shut off. Um, it means nobody can come into the meeting before you get there. Um, they'll get a nice, pleasant meeting a message that says you haven't arrived yet. Please be patient. And um, it prevents anybody from doing anything untoward before you're there. That just makes perfect sense. The next one is also very important. Don't use your personal meeting ID called your PMI when you're scheduling a meeting. This is how a lot of prominent people uh, have gotten Zoom bond um, because they use their personal meeting ID when they're holding a big meeting. The thing with your PMI is that it is always the same and that meeting is always on. So people could join that meeting even um, if you're not there unless you check the first box. But they're going to know this is a meeting you're going to keep coming back to and back to, and it's harder to prevent them from coming in. So absolutely shut that off. Um, on the next screen, we're going to look at um, using a personal, your PMI when starting an instant meeting. I don't have a problem with that. Um, so I go ahead and use that because I rarely use that, and I only use that when I'm going to jump onto a meeting with somebody uh, really impetuously for a few minutes and then get off. Next one is a big one. Only authenticated users can join meetings. Now, this is entirely your call, but it is one method of stopping Zoom bombing. Uh, what it means is that you have to have a Zoom account in order to be you uh, join the meeting. Now, Zoom accounts are free, uh, so it doesn't really stop somebody who's malicious from joining your meeting, but it puts one more behavioral step in between them um, wanting to join you and joining you and they have to be not anonymous. Now, again, they could do a fake email. There's, all, there's always a way around these things. But in general, this is going to filter out a lot of bad actors. So I leave that turned on. When you turn it on, you'll see the meeting authentication options. There's only one you can use um, realistically. There are other options, but they're not available techn technically for any of us. So just leave it where it comes up. Sign in to Zoom. That's all they have to do. This next one is also very useful. You can, again, you can decide this um, on a case by case basis. I leave it turned on so it's always an option, um, but it, it means that you have to have a password uh, in order to get into the meeting. 
Now, I will say uh, a couple uh, things down, you're going to see the sister to this. Um, but what this requires you to do is send the password separately from your invitation to the meeting. Now, there's a way around that as well. I'll talk about that at the very end. But um, this is a great way of preventing people from just jumping into your meeting because they have to have a password and you have to have given it to them. Now, that might be a problem for some kind of meetings where you're trying to open it up. Um, but um, there, again, there's ways around it. So I, I like to at least have the option of requiring a password when I start a new meeting. I don't require them for instant meetings because, again, I'm, I'm doing that with one person who I know. So I don't require a password for the PMI meetings because that's where I use them. Those three all kind of sit together. But the next one is really critical. Embedding the password in a meeting link for a one-click join. Well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a password. If you're going to require a password and then distribute it with the invitation, it's like you didn't use a password at all. So if you are going to require a password, please make sure this is turned off. Um, otherwise, you're, you're just creating more work for yourself with no particular benefit. Um, on the next screen, requiring a password for participants joining by phone. I don't do it. It's a pain for phone participants. Besides which, besides yelling at a few obscenities here and there, there's not much they can do. And I haven't seen much in the way of Zoom bombing of that sort. Uh, people generally looking for more than they can do just over the phone. So I don't worry about that. Muting participants upon entry, very useful. I do it. Um, just that gives you the control as to when they get to speak. If you don't recognize them, uh, you don't have to enable their, their voice. Um, the next few don't have anything to do with Zoom bombing. So I'm going to skip over them for now. Um, the next screen. There's some discussion about whether you should do these or not. I'd like to. Uh, one is chat. Do you allow chat? I do. Although you want to be sure that there's some other settings here that you, you also are careful with if you turn on chat. Um, yes, people could say offensive things there. But uh, again, I, I think that's they're mainly wanting to take over your screen and do something there. You can always boot somebody out if they're being offensive in chat. Also, private chat. Again, your call. I, I don't worry about people, what they're going to say to each other. If I were, I'd just shut it off. Um, and I will absolutely auto save chats. Saves me a step. I don't have to send them. I've got them there without thinking about it. Um, and playing sound when participants join and leave. Not a, not a Zoom bombing thing, but turn it off. It's so annoying. File transfer is important. Um, this allows people to send files through the chat. Shut it off. That's a great way for people to spread malware. You don't want them to have that there. So definitely turn that one off. Um, on the next screen, um, the next one that has a anything of interest to it is the ability to for the allow the host to put the attendee on hold. You definitely want this out. That's uh, on rather. You want to be able to take somebody out of the meeting, put them on hold, and you can decide whether you let them back in or not. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, so definitely want to do that. On the next screen, very important here, screen sharing. So you have to decide whether this is something you want or not. Um, I like to use screen sharing because I do a lot of teaching. Um, and I might want to show an image as I'm telling a story. So I definitely want the host to be able to share. But um, I have I don't let participants share. And that's in the meetings that I do. Now, if you're doing a storytelling um, thing and you want the, each participant to be able to um, to share, then you have to manage that more closely and you turn on all participants. Um, if you do that, you want, even though it's grayed out here because I only allow the host to share, um, you want to make it so that only the host can take sharing away from somebody else. You don't want somebody to be able to jump in and steal sharing from them. So, that's that's a good way to do it. Um, disabling the desktop or screen share for users. It's a little complicated, but think about what you want to do. If you turn this on, then they can share their entire desktop, no matter what's on it. Um, and sometimes people do that. In, un, you know, they might have things up there that they didn't intend to share. So I don't like to turn that on. If I turn it off, 
and I let somebody share their screen, it means they have to say, this is the particular window that I want to show. And that's just a, a best practice all the way around anyways. Um, annotation and whiteboarding, I leave on because, again, I teach, and they're very useful tools. And I don't think anybody's going to be scrawling things on a whiteboard. If they are, you can decide what you want to do about that. Remote control, absolutely shut this off. Um, the person who's sharing could allow other people to take over their uh, content. You don't want this to happen. That's how somebody could Zoom bomb. So shut that off, absolutely. Okay, next screen. Um, allow, remove participants to rejoin. Um, I'm draconian here. If I'm going to take you out, you're not coming back. Um, now, you could turn this back on, but then if you get somebody who you kick out, they can keep coming back, keep coming back, and I, I just don't want to do that, so I shut it off. Um, the breakout room doesn't really have to do Zoom bombing. I find it tremendously effective. Um, remote support. Now, you don't want this on. Uh, even though chances of you using it are slight, you just it's a good security practice. This allows you to take control of somebody else's computer. Um, please shut that off. Um, that's the only one that matters on this screen. Um, and on the, the last screen here, um, there's really nothing, uh, nothing relevant here to Zoom bombing that, that's relevant to you. Um, on the final screen here, um, there are a couple of things that have to do with Zoom bombing. The first one is waiting room down towards the bottom. Um, now, this is something you can turn on as an alternative to not letting people join before you. And it has that effect when people join um, before you're there, they're put into a waiting room. Now, I, I don't like this because the waiting room still is there and you still have to manage it even after the meeting starts. So while it does keep the beginning of the meeting or the pre-meeting time safe, it puts an extra burden on you as the host. So I just disabled join before the meeting and um, and shut this off altogether. Um, show a join from your browser link. Um, this allows people to join the meeting without having to download the Zoom application. Um, this is actually, there's very few people who can't un, uh, uh, download a Zoom app. And this does enable people to have a... Um, an opportunity to join in an unsupervised fashion, so I shut that off. Okay, and the last screen of this set, and then we'll talk about a different method altogether, is um, uh, the live streaming meetings. Uh, this has nothing to do with Zoom bombing directly, but um, you should know that if you decide to live stream your meetings, which is a real nice feature, um, you will be drawing people to you who you don't know. That's why you're streaming them over Facebook or YouTube, and it may entice them to come to your meeting and try and Zoom bomb. Nothing you should do here. I mean, if you're going to stream over Facebook, it's a great great feature, and you have that, that issue anyway, but um, just for you to know that that's there. Okay, that's it for this part. Next, I'm going to talk about registering people for meetings, which we used to think was only possible in... Um, the webinar product turns out it's possible in the meetings, and it's a great tool. So let's go over to that. Okay, so here we are. Um, I'm going to schedule a meeting, and you're going to see how we do the registration and how that all works. Uh, one thing I want you to notice is that I have left the generate automatically here. That's the default, given the settings we were talking about earlier. Um, I'm not using my personal meeting ID. Again, I don't do that at all. And by default, there is a meeting password required. You'll see how that plays in as we go. Um, so again, I give the way it's going to work is I'm going to give it a name. I may or may not give it a description. Go through all the scheduling stuff normally, and then come here and hit required. And that's going to open up another bunch of app opportunities that aren't don't pop up immediately on the screen, but I'll walk you through them. Um, all the settings that we talked about before are here. You notice I can change them on a meeting by meeting basis if, if I want. Um, and I'm going to save that and move on to the next screen. In this screen, 
um, you'll see I have um, the password has come through. But here's the key thing. People are required to register before joining this meeting. And there's an invitation link. So instead of sending out the meeting link, you're going to send out this registration link here. Um, and there's an easy way to copy it and then paste it into your email. Um, the same settings are here as were here before. This is the new version now that I've said register. And now there's this all this stuff here at the bottom that wasn't there before. The first is registration, and this just tells me how many have registered so far. None. I haven't published it yet. And do I want to get an email when each person registers? I've said no. Do I want to close the registration after the meeting date? Again, I've said no because I might want to make the contents available to people afterwards. Um, and I do want to show so show social share buttons. Ooh, that's a good one on the registration page. Here's the important thing. The well, next thing is um, email settings. Make sure it's your name and your email here. Um, and when the uh, person registers, they get a confirmation, which then has the link for them to be able to get in. And that's how they get the link to get in. Also very useful, and you only have to do it once, is branding. So, um, oh, I guess you have to do it more than once. So you can put a, a brand in here, um, a graphic brand as part of your thing. Um, I guess I'm going to save this as a meeting template so I don't have to do it again. And I have created a Zoom banner for this. And I've also created a Zoom uh, logo for this. And so now on the meeting, notice it goes out. I'm going to get um, this at the top of the page and this to the right of the page to let people know that indeed um, this is coming from me and a little reminder for who I am. So I'm going to save this as a meeting template. And I'm going to say uh, that that template name is with registration. And that's really helpful. Um, the other two, poll, um, there's no poll created. I don't use that very often. And live streaming, um, you can, uh, this is something you do online once it's done. So again, you don't have to select these at the, at the time. This is just saying these will be your options. Um, so now let's, let's go back to, um, and so now I would schedule the meeting. So um, this meeting is now scheduled. I would add it to my Outlook calendar. Um, and I'll just let you see how that appears. And now here it is in my um, calendar. That's the registration, that's the uh, meeting ID, not the registration ID. And if I look into my calendar, you'll see uh, here it is for later today. Um, so, anyway. That's the way that you make a meeting registration. The good news about doing that, we'll go back to the Zoom meeting, is then I can get reports on who actually uh, attended, um, who registered, and all that. All that information is available to me. Um, so I, I strongly recommend that. That, by the way, will also stop Zoom bombing because people will have to register. They'll have to send you an email. They'll get a link to it. It'll only work for their email address. And um, it, it's another way of, of cutting down on the Zoom bombing, but also building your, your email database as you go. So that's it.